I'm going to talk about high-end audio DACs and um, really try and um, shed a bit of light on uh, FPGA DACs and their advantages and disadvantages over ordinary high-end audio DACs. So FPGA is Field Programmable Gate Array, and you will know those as the DACs that are in most Cord products. So Rob Watts at Cord has done a fantastic job. They've absolutely led the market, blitzed everyone else. <coughs> but uh, essentially what's happening is that the changes are happening in the way that the standard DAC manufacturers manu their, manufacture their DACs, and therefore that gap is, is closing, in my view. And I think over the next couple of years, you'll see quite a lot of interesting development in this space. Now, uh, it's quite a technical lecture, but I've done my best to try and simplify it, and it does jump a bit all over the place because I do have to explain certain things, but trust me, it all comes together in the end, just like a good Agatha Christie movie. <coughs> so, um, so Cyrus has just launched a new DAC, which is a QXR card, which we can retrofit into any Cyrus integrated amp over the last 10 years. But then you, uh, the question is, why have we done this? Why have we launched a new DAC? And the answer is because there's a huge step up in performance over the DAC that we had in there previously. And that's because the technology is moving on. And it's moving on quite quickly. Uh, and it, um, it's moving on quite quickly, but it's also becoming more complex to get the best out of those DACs. So the, the skill level required in the R&D department has got to be quite high. So let's just go back a little further <coughs> and have a think about what, what is digital audio and why is, it, why is it so good? We started with a CD. Most people now are streaming. This is all, all digital audio. I mean, after all, our ears are analog. You know, what you listen to when you're listening to music, you're listening to sound pressure waves coming out of a speaker cone that's going back and forth and they're hitting your ear and your eardrum is vibrating. So we are analog people, and yet we're listening to music that is digital. So what's so good about digital? What's so good about it is it's robust. You can make perfect copies every time from a digital source file. And really, this was a problem that uh, recording artists using good old-fashioned tape, mastering tape, were running into real difficulties back in the 70s, uh, you know, late 70s. So, uh, does everyone remember this album? Yeah, one of the best recorded albums around at that time. You know, if you were at a hi-fi show in 1979, Fleetwood Mac rumors would be playing everywhere. Fleetwood Mac, massive band at the time, they had a huge budget, budget went to a recording studio <coughs> and got obsessed with remixing and remixing and remixing. But the problem with tape is that the first time you play it, it's a perfect, it plays back perfectly. The next time you play it, it's actually worn out a little bit. And by the time you play it the 10th time, you can actually hear a loss in some of those high frequencies. And they'd mix this track so many times that they were sitting listening to it and sound shit. You know, what's going on here? But fortunately, somebody had made a copy of the original masters. And they then spent a lot of time copying bits of the original master over onto their mix, and there was no syncing in those days. So you had one guy with one of the tapes in one ear and one in the other, trying to push it all together. But it was painstaking, but it really paid off. You know, what they got at the end of the day was a really good recording, because effectively they'd taken the original tapes, not used them for mixing until the final mix down. So they had maintained that quality. Um, I'm getting a lot of breath on my... Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's also stories about uh, Mike Oldfield, Tubular Bells, you know that album, obviously where he records all the tracks himself. 
he had to essentially re-record it because by the time he'd finished practicing all the pieces and, and doing the last one, the first track he'd played had been played so many times that the master tape had worn out, so he had to do a lot of those things again. So the recording industry and the studios really embraced digital because it enabled them to mix to their heart's content. You can try 25 different ways of um, recording a hi-hat symbol and, and you've got all that flexibility. So every recording studio in the, in the world these days is digital. So <coughs> what's happening though? How are, these dig how are these digital recordings made? Well, you need an analog to digital converter. So everything in the studio is analog. I'm talking to you, I am an analog. My larynx is causing sound pressure waves to come out of my mouth. You play a violin, the string vibrates. It's creating sound pressure waves, which you hear. So all of this is analog, and we need to convert it into something that's digital. So I'm going <coughs> to... Um, let's talk about how that happens. Now, you're an enthusiastic, well-educated audience, and you probably know exactly how digital signals get encoded. You get an analog waveform, you split it up into samples, you measure where those samples are, and you code that data, and you put it into a, what's called PCM, Pulse Code Modulation Data, which is what's on the CD and what all the DACs then read. <coughs> now, that is how it started, but it isn't what happens now. So, no recording studio has an analog to digital conversion that works like that. What they do have now is they use something called Delta Sigma. And I'm going to try and explain it to you with a few graphics. Sorry about that. A bit further, let's try that again. Right, so this is an animation. I'm going to keep stopping and pausing it. Where's my cursor gone? Here we go. So that's your incoming analog signal. And what an, a, what an analog to digital converter is doing, it's doing a good comparison of delta sigma. It's a comparison of the input and the output. But we'll represent that in this graph by, by this uh, triangular wave. And then what the DAC does is it, uh, the, sorry, the a to the analog to digital converter does, is it says, okay, is my analog signal above or below this comparator signal? Okay, it's below, therefore I'm going to output zero, and then it comes above it, so I'm going to output one. Then it's below it again, I'm outputting zero, and it goes along and, and, and does that constantly. And then what you're left with, sorry about that, So it does, it does that, and then obviously what you're then left with is, uh, what you're left with, if I can pause it at the right time. Actually, if I just run it and let it go, it should finish. Yeah, what you're left with is a signal that is a single bit. So the output is naught or one. But what you've got now is something called a pulse width modulated signal. So what's changing is the, the width between the ups and the downs. So you've taken something that was varying in amplitude in the frequency domain into something that now is just really varying in the time domain. Okay, So it's going from 0 to 1 in the time domain, which is why clocks are so vitally important when you're looking at digital signals and DACs. This, uh, for those of you who are into DSD, this is kind of what DSD is. You know, it's a single bit, not one um, signal. <coughs> but what's happening here, this is kind of more, more what it looks like. What's happening here is this switching is switching at a massively high frequency. You know, this is millions of times a second. These, this bit's going from naught to one. So you've got a really, really high data rate. But then what, what because 
PCM is what everyone uses, it's become an industry standard, we then actually have to convert this pulse width modulator signal back into a PCM. And so really what happens is that the, the analog to digital converter, it looks at, let's say, 16 slots, and it says, okay, that's a one, that's a zero, that's a one, that's a zero, adds them all up, divides by 16, and says, right, over that time period, <coughs> the value is 0.315. And it takes that 0.315, it puts it back into binary, because everything in PCM is in binary, and then that's, it, that's the output. So what you then end up with is, you know, the value of this is there, the value of this section is there, so you do end up with the points on the digital signal that we showed earlier, but we've got to it by a completely different route. I'm now going to change tack, and I want to talk to you about noise. Now, noise, my engineers spend 90% of their time trying to reduce noise, because that is what makes a really, really good hi-fi system. So if you've got noise anywhere in your circuitry, it's affecting the clarity of the signal, it's affecting the fidelity of what you're listening to. So, at Cyrus, we do all sorts of things. We look at power supply design, absolutely key in trying to reduce noise in a, in a hi-fi product. Track routing and layout, very critical. Where your signal goes, how it flows through the product. You don't want noise being carried from one part to another unnecessarily. <coughs> you know, on the latest QXR DAC, that we've done, we've got you know power flows one way, signal noise flows the other, so that you don't take noise from the noisiest part of the signal through the power circuit into the into the signal path. Component selection also very important, but DAC implementation is key also to try to reduce noise. You can do a lot of things in the way you implement a DAC to reduce the noise levels that are in it. Let me just talk a little bit about bit depth and noise. So what I mean by bit depth is that's the difference between a uh, 16-bit and a 32-bit file, for example. So over on the left here, we've got a lower bit rate file, a uh, bit depth file, and over on the right, we've got a higher bit depth file. So whilst I told you this isn't how it works in practice, it's a good graphical representation of explaining what noise, inherent noise, in bit depth is. So if I'm sampling a signal, <coughs> and I've you know, taken my sample, and I've got to um, you know, this bit here, well, the value I really want is here. But because I've only got so many bits, I've got to put the dot there or there. So I've got some inaccuracy, and that inaccuracy is in inherent noise. If I come over here, and I'm trying to get my dot on you know, this bit of the signal, you know, I can put it on this line or this line. So I'm much closer, much closer to where I want to be, so I've got less noise in the system. And if you think about it, this, these are in levels, and <coughs> they're represented by the total value of the, of, of the bit, but you know, you're going from you know, uh, from naught to what, you know, you're going up one step at a time. And your maximum noise level is half the distance between the two levels. So your noise level is half the value of the least significant bit in your total bit depth. Okay? So remember that, half the value of the least significant bit. If you've got an 8-bit track, you get 256. Of these, 16 bit gives you 65,536 different levels. If you move to 32, you get 4 billion different levels. So you can see that noise reduction between 16 and 32, or inherent noise reduction, is quite significant. So let's just talk a little bit about what do I mean by noise? 
noise is measured in decibels, and you often hear dynamic range quoted in decibels. Um, but let's put it into some kind of context. If you stand 20 meters from an airplane, jet airplane taking off, that's 150 dB, and you'll rupture your eardrums, and you won't be able to listen to any music ever again. Uh, 120 is quite painful to listen to. Things like a chainsaw, thunderclap. Even a motorbike at 25 feet, if you listen to that for eight hours, you could damage your hearing. You know, that's why people in machine shops and you know, they wear ear protectors all the time. But when you come down the scale, background noise in a quiet rural area is about 30 dB. Most listening rooms that you've got at home will probably be about at this level. The background noise in the room you're actually listening to is about 30 dB. 10 dB, that's, you know, if I could hear this gentleman breathing in the front row that would, and no one else was in the room and the whole room was anarchic chamber, that would be 10 dB of noise he'd be, he'd be generating. So, kind of in the real world, <coughs> you need about 100, 120-ish of dynamic range to capture everything you want to capture without damaging yourself. 32 bits will give you 196 dB of dynamic range. So, way more than you need. 24, 144, way more than you need, or more than you need. Real world's about here. 16 bit, which is CD, it's not bad. Does 96. And if you think about a listening room being 30, if you shove this up a lot, you're going to pretty much get what you need to capture everything that you want to listen to. So, which is why CD is you know, such a good format, work quite well. <coughs> The other thing it also explains, which is why I love this chart, is music sounds better louder. Obviously, we all know that. We all love turning it up. And that's because, obviously, if you turn the volume down, you're just squashing what the top of the dynamic range can be. And therefore, everything goes down, and the softer stuff that you could hear, you now can't hear because it's just too low for your, noise, your ears to pick up. So you have to have it loud to get all of the detail and the dynamic range that you want. Music sounds better loud, remember that. Scientifically a fact. <coughs> so that's noise. The holy grail for most engineers is around here, and everyone tries to aim for about 140 dB of dynamic range. Here are some website stats. Texas Instruments, big DAC provider. Really interesting, this one, though, because its best performing DAC isn't the 32-bit with the lowest inherent noise floor. It's the 24-bit, because there are other things happening inside the DAC that create noise. ESS, AKM, they've got a couple of 32-bit DACs that they claim are 140 dB. The Chord Dave is 127 and a half. So again, there's other things happening within the DAC that are creating noise which we'll come back to. Okay, so that's end of chapter two. Now I'm going to move on to chapter three <coughs> and talk about sampling rate and noise. Nyquist theorem uh, states that in a digital format, your sampling rate needs to be double the maximum frequency you want to capture. Okay, so again, um, if we look at the human ear, Peak sensitivity for the human ears at about 3K, 3 kilohertz, drops off pretty rapidly from 16, and perceived with or what most people work to when they're doing designs is to say, well, over 20K, we can't hear it. So we're not worried in audio performance about signals that are over, or being able to hear signals that are over 20K. Uh, so when we're implementing DAX, we filter out everything over 20K. And the reason we filter that out is because we've got sample rates that are higher than 28K, and they can create harmonics that can fold back below 20K into the audio spectrum. So you need to get them out so you don't get the artifacts coming back into the audio spectrum. 
So having said all that, a 44K CD signal can sample, can capture up to 22K beyond what you can hear, should be perfectly fine. And yet, hands up in the room who doesn't, no, hands up in the room who do think that a 96K file, which is a high res, sounds better than a CD. Yeah, everyone. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, anyone who's done a decent test between a proper high-res file and a CD file and a decent system, the high-res file will win, hands down. Why is that? We don't need that extra sampling rate. We don't need to catch those extra frequencies. Well, it's all about how the filtering is being done. Okay. So this is a very important slide. These are cutoff rates, so um, standard sampling rates, 48, 96, 192, giving you maximum capture frequencies of 24, 48, 96 kilohertz. In an ideal world, you want to filter everything out over 20K. This is this gray line here. But you can't get this, what they call a perfect knee. You can't get it to go that and then suddenly drop off. And even to do this, uh, to come down to zero at, at 24K, is a multi-order filter. It's quite complicated to, to put into place. And what happens when you've got something that's coming down this steeply is actually, you can see that blue line, you're getting ripples in the audio band. So you can hear instances in those high frequencies. And you also get a bit of phase shift going on up there as well. And that's why it doesn't work as well. However, if you've got the luxury of being able to only drop it down to zero by the time you get to 44K, you have a much smoother curve and you have much less blowback interference into the audio band. Same again with 96. So the higher that sample, the gentler that slope, the better the filter, the less disturbance you get in the audio band. <coughs> so imagine if you could sample at millions of times a second. So my cutoff frequency is now somewhere in the middle of hall two. So I've got a really, really gentle slope. So my, uh, the, the impact on the audio band is absolutely negligible. And this was the innovation that Cord came up with, and uh, Rob Watts did for, for Cord in the FPAGX. You know, all this programming, he was able to do this multi, uh, you know, really, really long tail filters. And that's why they sound so good. Now, I talked to you at the beginning about how analog to digital converters work in the modern day world, in the modern recording studio. So how does a modern digital to analog converter work. It actually works the, exactly the reverse of what I described to you earlier. So it takes the PCM code that's the standard and actually does a reverse piece of maths on it and turns it into a pulse width modulated signal. So it turns it into something like a DSD stream, single bit stream. And what we've got here, because we're turning something like that, is suddenly our switching frequency, which is effectively our sampling frequency, has gone up massively. So whilst we, you know, we've now got something that's sampling at, well, the latest DAC that we're using, 40 megahertz, so 40 million times a second, okay? <coughs> to get the analog out, you just need to pass this through a low-pass filter, and it turns it into an analog signal. So that bit's quite simple. But effectively, what, what's happened, because of the way the DACs are now working, this massively long filter cutoff slope is effectively built into the architecture of the DAC. That's what's happened. That's the kind of leap that's happened over the last couple of years. So, yeah, quite exciting for companies like us who can now do all sorts of things. So, um, But then let's talk a little bit about the some of the complexities of um, implementing a modern day DAC. So 
So as I explained, with the modern day DAC, we're now, it's effectively, it's using that pulse width modulated signal. Uh, so we've got a much, much higher carrier frequency and therefore we can have a much, much gentler slope, meaning we don't get throwback into the audio band when we do that filtering. The other thing you can actually do in a modern day DAC is what they call noise shaping. And to be brutally frank, I don't quite understand the fine detail of the technicalities, and I've read the paper several times. But what it's really doing, um, actually, let me bring back this. Let me bring back this chart. What it's effectively doing is, within this audio band, there is some level of noise that you've picked up in the recording. But with the digital filtering, what you can effectively do is take that noise and spread it out all the way over to your cutoff frequency so the absolute level of it drops and then when you filter it out you're effectively chucking the noise away okay so that's what, uh, that's really what noise shaping is doing but it is quite complicated in the way that it works <coughs> yeah you can yeah you can effectively move it out of the audio, move the noise out of the audio range. Now some DACs, Monday DACs, have got presets on them so you can choose your noise shaping profile that you want. You might have three, five, seven of these preset settings to choose from. Uh, on certainly the DAC that we've put in the QXL we've got from ESS, that can be customized. So you can customize the way that you choose to do the noise shaping to reduce the noise. And it looks something like this. So it's not simple. Now it's become a really complicated software problem or software skill now to implement these DACs because there's so much you can do with them. So let's just have a little look about FPGA versus spoke audio DACs and, and Where's the market come from and where might it go? <coughs> what you have on these FPGA DACs, as I said, was this innovation of this long filtering which made them so great. But if these guys have now caught up and they can also implement that just in the way that they've, uh, the, the way the DACs are working, what other bits have we got here? Well, um, an FPGA DAC is, or an FPGA chip, it's a multi-purpose chip, it's quite big, it's got millions and millions of gates on it. But you may not use them all, therefore if you're not using them all, you've got silicon inefficiencies and you've got possibly some noise on them. Whereas on a bespoke one, everything that's there is there because it needs to be there. So you haven't got any uh, excess or wasted uh, chips. <coughs> and I think the other thing that um, that may cause these bespoke DACs to really catch up is that uh, in terms of fabrication, these chips are made to be incredibly efficient in terms of processing power per, uh, per processing power per power consumption, if that makes sense. So processing power per watt. They're really designed to maximize that so you can do loads and loads of fantastic maths and you know, put 27th order filters into your programming. Whereas these are actually fabricated to deliberately try and reduce the inherent noise level that's sitting in, in the silicon itself. You know, the way they choose to make it is all designed to reduce noise because these are audio guys that are really focusing on noise reduction and these guys are focusing on um, um, processing power per, per wattage. That's not to say, of course, that once you've got this, you can do an awful lot with it. So there's still some pros and cons here, but my feeling is that <coughs> you know, you've got Texas Instruments and ESS and they're like you know, really having to up their game. They've started to do that and I think there will be continue to be more innovations coming out of these, uh, these, these companies. Which I think is a re for me is really exciting um, because it means that we've got more things that we can do. <coughs> so what do we do at Cyrus? How do we take advantage of this? Uh, noise shaping. Certainly I've got a couple of guys in R&D now who've kind of made it their 
passionate expertise to practice and work out how they can implement this better. So you know, that we, they've done a, a fantastic job on that. Um, it can also, you can also change the tonal balance of a DAC by uh, using, <coughs> if you want it to sound warmer, you can increase even harmonics, you can increase odd harmonics to make it sound a bit sharper. And you, can, you can play very subtly with the presentation of the sound by changing what the DAC is doing in some of its software. And for us, that's a massive benefit because one of the things we do at Cyrus and we have done for a long time is every time we have a prototype, <coughs> we sit in the listening room and we will change a capacitor. So we'll change a capacitor from, from one manufacturer to a capacitor from another manufacturer, probably with the same value. And then we'll listen to it and we'll see if it sounds different. And we'll choose the one that we prefer. And we'll do that many times at many points in the circuit. So that takes a couple of weeks, that process. But we've now got another tool in our armory because actually we can take the DAC and we can make changes in the software to subtly shift how that's sounding as well. And therefore we can combine that with what we're doing in the actual electronic component domain to, re you know, to really um, focus where we want that, that product to sound. So for me, it's very exciting. You know, I think there's lots of, and you'll see over the next couple of years, I believe quite a lot of advancement in DAC technology coming out of the major audio DAC manufacturers. Um, that's it. I hope it wasn't too complicated. I hope it was a, insightful and gave you a bit of an idea on what's happening in the, in the high-end audio DAC world. Has anyone got any questions? It's just more data. You know, what you're doing is you're getting the, they're getting the, uh, they're just capturing more data. And so the files are, you know, bigger, you know, much bigger. You know, you get, when you go from something like a CD to a 32196 file, it's something like 100 times the file size. You know, you need massive amounts of space for these things, which is why most audio files, uh, in my experience, you know, you can, you can hear the difference between a CD and a, and a 24192 file. Getting the difference between 24192 and a 32786 file, that's, more, that's a smaller audience who can actually spot that difference. I think that could be potentially very exciting because, I mean, what you've... It depends. It's all about how you implement these things. There's what, every time you come up with a great concept and say, yeah, look, I can combine the best of this bit with the best of that bit, what's happening to the noise? Are you putting more noise into the system? I mean, we did an amplifier back in the mid-90s called the straight line. You know, the best amplifier is a single copper wire with gain. You know, that's how you define it. You know, the less you put in the way, the less noise you're going to get and the more faithful it's going to be represented. But then you've got, okay, well, digital's fantastic because we can get perfect copies every time and we can carry them around in our pocket and stream them over the airways. So we should embrace that. But how do we turn that into an analog signal that we can hear without introducing you know, by introducing as little noise as possible. So, could be great, need to think about how it's implemented. <laughs>